Let me try to extend that thank you to a bunch of other people, uh, like all the volunteers, all the organizers. This is a huge endeavor, so thank you to them. The sponsors, thank you very much. Please, if you can, next time, more money. Uh, and the often forgotten uh, technical people, uh, like my, Matteo out there that are doing sound, video, uh, stage lighting and stage support. Let's have a quick hand for all of these people. Thank you. <laughs> so hello, uh, my name is Tiago. I come from Lisbon in sunny Portugal, which I invite you to visit. Uh, you will be welcome. And this story starts back in January when a very dear friend of mine came to me, knowing that I do these kinds of these kinds, of, these kinds of things professionally, uh, and he asked me, Tiago, would you organize an introduction to programming with Python workshop for my oldest kid, along with a few of his friends from school? Hmm. Well, these kids are about 12 years old. And of course I said yes, knowing two things from the start. The first one is that working with kids is a very serious business, so an appropriately serious amount of preparation was in order. And the other thing was that I wouldn't be able to reuse none of the materials, tools, exercises, whatever, that I normally use when I train professional developers. And here we go. Uh, so instead, I need to go for a much more informal approach, like a learn-by-doing approach in a friendly, fun, if somewhat chaotic environment where kids would be really engaged into the thing uh, without, you know, kind of barriers. Uh, so we would go for a learn-by-doing in a, lots of many code-along sessions where I would explain a, maybe a simple concept, type a few lines of Python, maybe one, maybe two, and they tap along and they run it. And we'd do that repeatedly until we reached like a mini project that was fun and they could then explore. And then we did that three or four times and I wanted the last project to be something they would be really proud of. They would take home and share with their friends and family, you know, and it would need to be a game. Now, the, we're having a problem with the projection. May I plug and unplug? Do you need anything, Matteo? Are we okay? Okay. Uh, I'll move on, I'll move on. You won't be able to see the code if it's not projecting, but I'll keep talking, don't worry. Um, so we need it. Thank you. So given that we were starting from the turtle module, I wanted to see if we could build the game with the turtle module. Okay, and if you don't know the turtle module, let me show it to you, hopefully. <laughs> I'll try that, uh, I'll try that. So the turtle module implements, as the name implies, uh, turtle graphics. And turtle graphics are a thing that, back from the 1960s, where you get a, a canvas, okay, and a turtle. Uh, this is from a programming environment called Logo back then. And you get a canvas and a turtle, and essentially you can say things like, turtle, go forward a certain amount, and you see, the turtle goes forward, okay? Um, and then you can say, uh, well, dear turtle, can you please turn left? And it does turn left. Do we need to make a break to fix this? No problem. There's no problem at all. We can try and see what's going on. So there's this certain amount of primitives that we can tell the turtle to do, like you see. Okay, it's stable now, so it's just a glitch. So now we turn the turtle, we say, go forward, and now it goes forward in a different direction. It keeps drawing a line, so it's pretty intuitive. It behaves pretty much like a pencil on a sheet of paper. And pretty much like a pencil, you can say, well, turtle, go up, okay? It should be fly, because the turtle should fly for kids, but it, it's forward, no problem. I mean, if we now say, go forward, now it goes forward, but doesn't draw the line, so it nicely animates. This could be useful for a game, I said. Oh, this can be useful. And then there's other fun things that we can do. We can tell it, go forward, a negative amount of distance, whatever, and it goes backward, which is kind of intuitive, maybe. And more, if we bring it down again, such that it goes back to drawing lines as it moves, we can also tell the turtle to go to a specific point in the canvas, uh, and it will go there directly in a straight line, regardless of being facing 
whatever it is. So it's now kind of facing up. But if you tell it to go to the origin, which is the point where it started, in the center of the canvas, and there it goes. It draws a straight line, OK? So the question is, could we build a game with this? And again, the answer is yes. And let me show you, OK? Uh, what do I want to do? I want to start with something like, what's Python 3.7 maybe, shall we? Uh, let's do that. It's here, game.py. And we will make it executable. And don't, don't worry about this. You, you really don't care about this. What you care is this. So we'll import it to a module, OK? And we'll run it like this. And if we run this, this main loop thing here is just like keeping the canvas window open, OK? So let's pimp it up just a bit. And we can pimp it up by setting up a screen thing that's here, OK? And we say start x 600 to shift the, the canvas more towards the right-hand side of the screen. And we'd like to work with the known width and height. So 640 should be enough for anyone. Mr. Bill Gates has said that. So <laughs> let's go with that. And, uh, Let's give it a nice orange background color. And if you haven't made any horrible mistake, we now have a nice orange canvas. So what kind of game do we build with an orange canvas? Well, given that Minecraft and Fortnite were taken, OK, so we went a different route. And in our game, there will be two characters, uh, a player, player control ca character, aptly named ca player, and a beast. So it's the player and the beast. And these characters move around in a grid, somehow constrained in a grid. And the purpose is you control the player, you need to capture the beast, the beast runs away randomly, OK? Pretty simple, uh, much better than all those other fancy stuff. So we will start by drawing a grid uh, to help us out with this. So bear with me for a minute. And this will define the grid size, uh, which is the, the grid size, each cell size, the grid span, which is the how many cells we'll have from the center of the canvas, and we'll use this one, grid max, which will be used all around. So this would be grid size times grid grid, no, grid size, OK, go, and grid mag, grid span. And we'll draw the grid using a line function that draws arbitrary lines. So let's go here and here. And we'll, we know these. We can say total up, and then we go. So we'll go to the starting point, like x1, y1, and then we duplicate these ones, say go down, and now go to the end point. OK, so this would be 2 and 2. And now we can iterate over the range for, for i n range of minus grid span to grid span, OK, plus 1, because there's always this plus 1, isn't there? Uh, scale i equals i times grid size. And now we'll draw a line from minus grid max, that's the leftmost edge, let's say, of the grid, uh, scaled i, and to grid max scaled i. If we run this, and if I haven't made any horrible mistake, there you go, the turtle slowly trying to draw grid. So let's, let's speed it up, OK? Let's speed it up. Hang on, hang on. We're, ju we're just starting, OK? Let's, let's, let's keep having some fun. So we can say something that's not very intuitive at all if you look at the docs, but the speed, they, they tell you in the docs it's from, zero to ten, from 1 to 10, 10 being the fastest. But if you tell it's 0, it's even faster, OK? So go, you go 0. Uh, you can hide the turtle, and you can tell it, like, give it a nice, you know, dark orange background color, because to match the background, the, the nice orange color for the line, let's make it thicker, you know, for, for effect, whatever. And by the way, let's swap these coordinates here, OK? And uh, we get the vertical lines as well. And we get a grid, a much finer looking grid. Right, so this is a grid. We need the players, the characters, OK? And the one very interesting thing in the total module is that we can have as many turtles as we like, OK? We don't get just one. So how do we create a turtle like this? Let's see. Uh, you go player equals turtle. That's a module. And there's a turtle class. And that's it. And you get a new turtle. And you can have as many as you like. And there's your turtle. Not a very engaging character in the game, OK? You're a 12-year-old. You want to see something more engaging. So there's yet another thing that the turtle module can do, which is very cool, OK? Uh, if I can properly copy this line, of course. So that would be, you can register a shape and give it a file, OK, you have on disk. That would be player gif. I'll tell you about the file in a, in, a mo in a moment. And then once you do that, you can tell the player turtle to use that shape. Once you do this, 
you get this guy. And now the kid's eyes go, oh, I like this. I know how to move this guy. It's move and go to and forward, OK? Uh, so let me tell you about these files in a quick minute. Uh, so I brought, brought along these two files here, which I obtained from opengameart.org. OK, go there. Lots of cool stuff, thanks to the authors. Um, and the other thing we want to do, of course, is to control this player character with a keyboard. So how can we do that? Well, here's another trick that the Turtle module has for us. So that's a two-step process. OK, we say something like this. On key, funk, and then up. And the idea is <clears throat> the listen function tells the main loop, OK, when it enters the main loop, to keep listening for keyboard events, and this other call on key tells the main loop to call the function func every time the up key on my keyboard is pressed. Okay? So we will need four of these because we want to control the player in all directions, down, left, left, and right. Right? Right. Uh, and as for func, let's go a bit funky okay, here. I'll go with a lambda. Don't worry too much for now. I'm just, going, I'm just being generic here, OK? And when we move up and down, x doesn't change. When we move left and right, y doesn't change. When we, when we move up, y is positive. Down is y is negative. Left, x is negative. And right, x is positive. Now, if we just need to create the move player function. Don't you like the justs that we keep introducing in our speech? Just, just. It seems as, as if it's obvious. It's not, OK? Especially when working with beginners. So we will create the move player like this. So it takes a delta x and a delta y. So we'll try to move the player relatively to where it is. So if we knew where the player is, we don't, OK? We could do something like player go to, remember this one, wherever you are, plus the delta x, x times the grid size, right? And wherever you are on the y-axis, plus the delta y times the grid size. And if we knew the player position, if only we knew the player position. OK, that's it. OK, <laughs> if only we knew it. Uh, and you go like this. And now if I hit my keyboard, oh, there it goes, OK? It's drawing a line because, guess what? That's what turtles do here, OK? But we know how to fix that, OK? Because we have the player fly or up method, if we do this, then it moves nicely, okay? And it can go crazy, but we don't really care, okay? It moves. <clears throat> What's missing? Well, the other character, the beast, right? So we, we might feel tempted to, like, copy and paste these. We won't do that. You don't copy and paste code. Don't. Uh, I'll do a few of that, but we'll get to that. But so we'll, we'll instead create an actor function that will create an actor or a character for us, OK? And the way to do that could be, one possible way would be, let's say, this image, OK, an image. Then we'll return this thing that we're creating here. I don't like that. It's called player, because it doesn't make much sense any longer. So let's call it T. And say that player is actor. Player gif, OK? And this should work, OK? And now we can just copy it over and say beast. And we have a player and a beast. And there's the beast, OK? It's sitting there still. So let's make it move around. <clears throat> uh, so what we could create maybe a, a move beast function, OK? Uh, let's see, find a move beast function here that will move it kind of randomly. Ran and from minus grid span to blah, blah, blah. You know, this is the boring part. Sorry for that. But you know, there's no fun without pain, uh, I guess. So we can say beast now go to guru. OK, I'm kind of Japanese-ish today. Um, X times grid size. Uh, and y times grid size, I guess. And now this function just moves the beast at some point in random, the grid. We'll call it right before starting here. And the other thing we're going to do is we'll need to import the random module, right? Because we're using the random function. So there it goes. OK, so it's there. Let's start it again. Let's see where it goes, OK? So, OK, it goes there. Now the idea is that we'll move the player. And as we move, we need to see, did we capture the beast, yes or no? And when we'll, get, when we'll capture the beast, the beast will do like a, let's call it a small dance, as if, as if it's stunned by being caught. Then it runs away again. <clears throat> so the way to do that is, let's say, every time we move the player, we will attempt a capture, say, a capture, capture. OK, and what's that? So attempting a capture might be something like, well, if the player position uh, is equal to the beast position, right? Uh, then uh, beast do a dance. Doing a dance might be drawing a circle, which is yet another method of turtles that, you know, appropriately named, draws a circle. But since it's raised, it won't draw it. Just do a little dance. Uh, 
go reduce the steps to make it faster, and then you say move beat, so go away from wherever you are, and let's see how it goes. If I save this and run it. So, dance goes away, cool, okay, dance goes away. Dance goes away, okay, cool. But it's, it's really not challenging because as we move, uh, the beast is just sitting there, so it needs to be a bit more challenging. So maybe uh, whenever we move, there's some odds that the, that the beast will, will try to cheat, trick us, okay? So we might say something like, well, uh, else, if we, if we didn't capture, okay, so maybe if random.random, .random, this is, will give us a, a random number between zero and one, okay, we call it lower than be move beast odds, we'll, we'll just move the beast, okay? So the, the bigger this number is, the bigger the odds are the beast moving around and tricking us. So we'll set this, call it the game difficulty constant here, uh, and we'll say, well, let's make it one in five, 0 0.2. So let's see how it goes. So dangerous, this is random in a live coding scenario, so it might never happen, but it did, you see. I'll just move around and see if the beast, okay, the beast, it's very dumb sometimes, but when you really want to capture it, you'll see there's some artificial intelligence here. The random number knows. <laughs> I know that. I've been playing this, and the kids know too. So, so if you take a look at this, okay, uh, so the game is already cool, okay, you can play it around, but there's a very serious problem with this game, and that's it never ends. And with kids, you need games to end, because at some point you'll be telling kids, come over, it's dinner time, and they say, hey dad, let me just finish the game. <laughs> it doesn't finish, so it must finish, okay? Um, so we'll introduce the concept of, say, of energy or karma, which will, again, be visually represented by yet another turtle, of course, and we'll have a, like a, a turtle center on top of the grid, and the turtle will move slowly towards the left as the player moves, okay? And if it ever reaches the leftmost edge, the player loses. And on the other hand, Whenever the player captures the beast, the karma will move like a chunk towards the right, and if it ever reaches the rightmost edge, the player wins. Okay, so, so let's build this step by step. Um, so we need a, a new turtle, a new karma turtle. So let's go there, we'll just, yeah, this is the time for copying and pasting, right? We can copy and paste this. Karma, but oh, come on, I don't have a karma.gif image on disk, so what, what am I to do? Well, it turns out that if you look at our actor function that creates a turtle, registers the shape, loads it from disk, and then tells the turtle to use it, okay? It turns out there are a few built-in shapes in the turtle module that don't require registering, okay? And one of those is called circle, which we'll use here, which will fail to register because register will try to open a file on disk. So we'll say, well, if the image ends with, you know, .gif, then register it. Otherwise, assume it's a built-in shape and just go ahead and do it. And there's our karma turtle. Uh, it's not at the right place, and it's kind of dark. No, nobody wants a dark karma, right? So, so let, let's make it shiny a bit. So one thing I'd like to do is something like uh, maybe color equals gold. I don't know. Uh, and for that, we'll add a, like, uh, a keyword argument here, uh, defaulting to black so that I don't need to go back and change all the other code, and say, this is the turtle I created locally, and say color color, okay, and this should work, and then we'll tell the comma turtle to go to zero, that's horizontal center, and then with max, which is the top of the grid, and just a little bit further up, and that, thing. whenever you need it a little bit further up in a crazy number, you go with 42 and nothing can go wrong. Uh, <laughs> so there you go, there's our comma turtle, okay, and now it needs to move depending on the result of the game, and if you remember, uh, even though it's a circle, it's facing towards the right-hand side, okay? So we'll use that forward positive number, forward negative, uh, as a trick to move it left or right, uh, so that moving the karma turtle is just a matter of saying, karma, go forward this number, okay? So to do that, we'll create a, 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 an update karma function somewhere here. Let's say, where, 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 where? Maybe here. Not here, Tiago. Uh, maybe here. So up, let's call update karma. It takes a delta karma, which will be positive or negative, uh, depending. And we'll say, go forward, uh, delta karma. That's it, okay? And now, in our attempt to capture, we say, well, this is a, a capture case. So we'll say update karma with a karma value of a capture. And we'll set this variable to a positive value. And then this is the case where we moved but didn't capture, so uh, we'll go there and say comma move, and we'll set these two here, maybe, uh, 
let's say this one is 100, and maybe this one, this one I know it needs to be negative, so let's go minus 20, say, and we'll get, go, get back to our code, and let's run it and see if it moves. Okay, slowly towards the left, right? Slowly towards the left, and now it should jump towards the right-hand side. Okay, this is working, good. You, you get the idea. All we need to, know, to do now is to find our boundary condition, conditions, detect them, and tell game over, you won, game over, you lost. Uh, and we do that uh, by checking the comma position, the horizontal position after every move. So we'll, we, we'll grab the comma x and comma y, we already know the, these, comma y equals uh, comma position, right? Uh, but we really don't care about the y, so let's go like this, okay? That's a throwaway variable. And we say, well, if karma, where's my keyboard? Comma x is greater than or equal to grid max, then let's say end game, we'll give it, um, this is winning, so let's say, yay, victory. Congratulations, you won. And otherwise, we can say, well, uh, if it's negative, if it's below uh, negative gr grid max, so this is certainly a defeat, so let's go, ah, defeat, sorry for that, try again. Where end game, where the end game function is a function that takes a message and uses the write method of turtles that just displays text strings besides the turtles. We don't have much control, but it's good enough. We have control on over the alignment, the horizontal alignment, which we'll try to center on the turtle. We will override default font because the default font is actually too tiny for this kind of game. And I thought, why not go with Helvetica for two reasons, okay? So it's a hallmark of Swiss design, and it seemed appropriate. Uh, and you really can't go wrong. No, nobody was ever fired by using Helvetica. So don't be creative <laughs> with your fonts. Use Helvetica and you'll be fine, okay? Uh, so if you, I don't want to go off rail, but I love typography, so don't use other things. Don't be creative. Uh, so this should work, okay? So just write some message. And we're going to test this by cheating a bit, so because we don't have that much time. So we're just going to say, well, let's win this really quickly. We, we'll always win really quickly. Uh, and here we go. So we move. Yeah, we're about to win anyway. I don't really care. I go up and down. I don't care. I win. Victory. Great. Um, so it seems to work. Uh, the text is in black. I'd rather have it in white. But if you recall, the turtle's default color is black. So I'll change it to white. Uh, and there's another thing. And that's a, a much more serious thing. Because if I head up, you see, the, the, the game is still on, okay? And why is that? Look at our curve. So we said uh, end game, but what does end game do? So we, we thought end game meant everything's done, but all we did in end game, sorry for that, is we wrote a text message. But originally, when we set up the keyboard things, we told listen, and whenever this key is pressed, do this and this, call the move. It's still doing it. It's still doing that. We haven't told it, stop doing that. So. Ideally, we would do turtle and lesson, so forget about the keyboard, just be, be still. Uh, we can't do that, the turtle module doesn't have that, so we'll hack it away uh, in, a, in a very ugly uh, approach. But it works, so I don't care. Uh, up, down, uh, left, left and right. And I'll tell you a bit about why I think this is really bad later, but if we have the time, okay? Uh, on key, we'll, we'll go the on key again, but now we'll say, well, for these keys, use the none function. So it means forget about any uh, thing you knew about this key, okay? And we want the player turtle to be white. You remember that? And this should be pretty fast and cool like this. So let's see, okay, down. Oh, I want to win really quickly, yes. We're, cheat, we're in cheat mode, because we are the coders. We can do anything, right? It's very powerful. Victory, good. And now I'll bang on my keyboard to see if it works. Okay, I'm banging. This is one of those Apple computers, but one of those oldest that used to come out with a real keyboard, okay? The new ones seem kind of flaky. Uh, that's not the case. So Tim, please fix the, the keyboards, okay? Uh, thank you. Uh, this is working. And what I'm going to do is cheat the other way around to check that my losing condition is being properly checked. Uh, and we're nearly done, okay? So let's go minus, what's minus 82, why not? Let's make it go faster, go, go faster. Faster, faster for kids is great. So don't capture the beast, we, we want to lose this really quickly, and defeat, and bang on our keyboard. So the game is nearly done, okay? This was my original plan for the game, but the kids came and said, yes, but we need the score, okay? We need the motive to come back to the game and do better. That makes a lot of sense, okay? Uh, so they came up with this very simple and effective idea. 
And what they came up with is, well, if we counted the number of steps that the player does along the, the game, and you just need to print them at the end. So if you win, you want to win with as few steps as possible. OK, that's reasonable. It's a better score. And if you lose, uh, I don't know, ask the kids. OK, so there's a score. Let's, let's, let's implement that really quickly. Uh, and the way to do that is or one way to do that, because there's no single way to do things. We'll do it like this. Uh, well, player steps equals 0. Start counting steps at 0, OK, when things start. And then every time the player moves, this is the function. We will just increment it, plus 1. Okay, and then if you remember, there's a method here in game that writes a message with the you won, you lost. We'll just copy and paste that and use a comma turtle to write a different message. We'll use a funky f string. F strings are so cool. Uh, don't you like them? Yeah. Uh, player steps, uh, and we'll make it uh, just slightly smaller, and this should be it. Let's see. Three, three statements of Python. We, we, we've implemented a score. Isn't Python cool? Uh, three steps, good. Uh, so let's cheat the other way around. Okay, or right. let's instead. Remove the cheat and go for a real quick run of the game to get a feel, okay? And I won't go it till the end, because this is one of those games that may never end, so dangerous for the dinner thing with the kids, but uh, it seems to work, okay? It's fun and engaging enough, and I won't play it anymore. I won't bore you, because if you play it, you'll have fun, but just watching it is boring, okay? So, so let's step back for a minute. What do we have here? So you have 100 lines of Python code, uh, created pretty much in a make it up as you go along way. Okay, yeah, I, I don't care. Just create a function. Oh, that's not cool. And what I'd like to do now is do a, a quick review of this code. Of, I'll highlight a few things. I don't have time for to go over all of it, of course. Highlighting maybe good ideas, bad ideas. Would you do this at work? Yes or no? Okay. So let's get here. For example, these variables or constants. Th these are a very good practice. Uh, the Character movements and the grid drawing, they're all based on these constants. So if we need to change something, let's say, if I go 5 here, 5, can I go 5, please? Uh, 5, yeah, there you go, 5. Um, then it all still works, OK? So, so this is clearly something that you would do at work. It's a good practice, OK, to have common constants or variables. And same can be said for these. That's the game difficulty, OK? That's a good thing. Uh, then I'm going to take a look at these. This is kind of a mess. So this loop draws the grid, but it's difficult to read. I wouldn't want something like this in my serious, sustainable code. Maybe it's the variable names I selected. I don't know. But I don't like this very much. It's hard to read. It's lots of geometry. Bah, I hate it. Uh, but, but it works. There you go. Um, and then there's this line. This line deserves a mention because it could have been written as if image of minus 4 to blah, blah, blah equals to dot kill, blah, blah, blah. And these are semantically equivalent. And I claim that the first one that I used is much better for two reasons. First reason, readability. Read that says if image ends with that, so it's clear for you to your brain, it's dark to your brain, this string ends with that string. Whereas in the other one, whether you're a beginner or an experienced professional, something like this is going on more consciously or subconsciously. Mm, what's that? Oh, that's the colon thing. The colon thing is a slice. It's from there to there. What's the there on the right? Oh, there's nothing there on the right-hand side. So that's still the end of the string. OK, what about minus 4? So that's 4 from the end. Does it include the 4th from the end, or is it from the 5th or from the month? It's a mess, OK? This happens in a split second for advanced developers. And it takes a long time for beginners. It's not readable. And then there's this. If you change at some point your mind, you want to use JPEG images, OK, then this line of code still works, and the other one doesn't any longer, because image of minus 4 till the end is 4 characters long, and dot JPEG is 5 characters long. So you need to change in two places. You need to change your code on both sides of the comparison. So it's clearly a worse solution, OK? So go with ends with and starts with. It's simpler. It's re it's, I don't, just use ends with and starts with, OK? Keep it simple. Uh, now this deserves some mention, too. What's going on here? So we're calling the active function that creates a turtle, ready to use, OK? So we're ready to play with it. And then we're slapping uh, a dot steps attribute there to count the steps. It's our solution to 
tracking the player steps. And it's effective, simple, okay. So let's, let's review this. So in general, everything in Python is an object. And Python objects have a type and have attributes. Now, again, in general, any piece of code can, you know, create, destroy, rebind, or reassign values to any attribute in any object. There's no protections. There are some exceptions to this, but this is the fundamental model of the way Python works. Um, so in general, this is not really a good idea because we're poking around at objects that might behave differently, okay? So this isn't something you would do at work, but it's possible. And again, with great power comes great responsibility, so use these kinds of things wisely. But I wouldn't want this in any serious, sustainable code, okay? It, we would need to find different solutions to that. Uh, now, I'll highlight just one more thing, two more things uh, uh, for the sake of time so that we can step back furthermore. And again, this statement could have been written as comma position of zero or bracket zero. And again, I say that the one I used is better for two reasons. First, again, readability, okay? Maybe for some people, that funky thing with the comma, comma, and the score, blah, 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 is somewhat strange, okay? But you'll quickly get used to that. What I claim is that this line has the comma position in parentheses and brackets and blah, okay? So it's slightly harder to read, uh, okay? I'll grant you that might be a personal opinion, but check this. When you look at this code, you wonder, well, could I have used 42 instead of zero? Or could I, maybe, maybe that comma position is a dictionary-like thing? Maybe could I have used key there? You don't know. The only way to answer this, these questions is to look at the function documentation, okay? Or, God forbid, look at the source code. You're, you're, you're worried about your update karma function. You don't want to know about the others. Whereas here, okay, you know that that karma position thing, I'll short, short it to right-hand side, is iterable. That's a funky thing, okay? And we, we won't go into that, but think, think, uh, list like maybe it's it's a bunch of things okay it's a bunch of things uh, and if you want to know more we, we'll talk in the corridors uh, and it's iterable and it has two let's call it two elements okay it's guaranteed to have that because there are two things here come separated otherwise this code wouldn't work okay and by the way if we're using that underscore that's a variable like anyone like any other but it's a way of saying we don't really care about what's here, okay? So, so, so we also know that we care about the first, okay? So it's clearly first, no, first, Tiago. Uh, so it's clear, other than readability, the line that I used gives you three facts immediately, and the other line leaves you with a few questions, okay? So again, I say this is better. And there's a very interesting article by Trey Hunter, I think. Trey Hunter, he's a trainer uh, too, I think. Uh, go read it and come to me, I can point you to that. It's very interesting on this idea, okay? And let's wrap up our code review to move on to some different thoughts. And I'll just go here. This is the most horrible two lines I've written here in my understanding. And why? Because there's repetition. The, the up, down, left, and right string constants are repeated here. And you see in this code that sets up the keyboard initially. And that's really a no, 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 no. So possible solutions would be to define constants with these values, uh, wrap them in a list, in a dictionary, create an enum, something like that. This is, this is really, you wouldn't do this at work. I would be angry or disappointed if someone said, Tiago just created the best looking code. Out there. Now, can you, I think we can improve that, okay? So let's, let's forget about the code for a minute, okay? So this is the code. Uh, now, here are a few thoughts. Well, the Python standard library is amazing. It has a bunch of functionality in it. Quite often, it, was, it does surprise you, okay? It's, it has its smelling corners, it does, but uh, if you dig deeper into a given module, you're bound to be surprised and you're bound to find useful functions, tidbits, examples, okay? That was the case with the turtle module. I didn't know you could do this with the turtle module. Keyboard input, multiple turtles. 
GIF images, I can do a bunch, okay? I can nearly serve a breakfast with a turtle module, I don't know. Um, so there, there have been recent discussions on the standard library and they're very relevant, I think. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that the standard library is bound to change in the long term, okay? But in the near term, it will stay pretty much as it is and knowing it and using it is a very, a very valuable skill uh, don't rush into it. It takes time, but it, it pays back. So uh, I learn a lot. I'll, every time I go into the docs, go docs, Python org, then library reference. Uh, that's it. You go there, there's a bunch of cool things. Um, and then, of course, there's this, you know, I, I'll read my own slides. Don't do this. Uh, direct in your uh, face, Python is effective and fun, and it is. And maybe the reason why so many of us are here today, because so one day we said, oh, this is Python, let me try this, mm, funny. And then, oh, cool, oh, I like this, I want more. And then 15 years later, here you are. Uh, I don't know if you relate to this, uh, but this is what happened to me. Uh, and having fun is obviously the best way to learn new things. And the kids did learn a few things. Uh, well, the workshop was back in March, and certainly uh, three months after the fact, or four, whatever, uh, they probably don't know much Python now. But there's one thing they learned. They will never forget. And that is that their gaming consoles, their tablets, their electronic devices, they're all programmable. They have seen, seen the light in a way. They know there's a way to make the machine do something they want. So maybe in 5, 10, 20, 40 years' time, they're faced with some kind of software that does, just doesn't feel right for some reason. They know, no, I know how to fix it. I, I'll go pick up back on that path. And this is a very powerful thing to know that you can't really unlearn, okay? And this was my main objective with the kids here. These machines, you are the master, so you can make them do whatever you want, okay? So if you want, go do that. Now, what if you're a professional seasoned developer, four years experience, you're, you've done it all. You've never done it all, okay? That's my, my opinion. There's always something else to do. Now, would you do this at work? Not something like this, exactly this, this silly game. Would you do it? Well, could you learn something from it? Would, say, extending it to network-based gameplay. Would you learn socket programming, IP addressing, IPv6, by the way, a DNS, I don't know, Bluetooth? Would you learn that there's no way, no technology, no protocol, no whatever that guarantees that when you send a message out through the network, there's no guarantee that you'll ever get back a response. So you need to use timers and timeouts and things. Would you learn something from it? Or would that compel you to write a low-level event loop, uh, managing network traffic, keyboard input, internal animation, and, and sound, by the way, why not? Uh, and would that help you understand different models of concurrent programming with coroutines and learning about the async and await keywords that are so mysterious to many. Would that be helpful in something else that you do? Would you learn about race conditions? This game here has race conditions. Uh, you might say, oh, I don't care about race conditions because I do data analysis. And you know, you don't need network code to have race conditions. You don't need to have event-driven code to have race conditions. All you need to have is concurrency, and concurrency is everywhere, more and more. But tuning your mind into grasping what the race condition is and kind of smelling it from the distance and knowing how to avoid and improve your code to avoid those because they are, they are very difficult to diagnose and fix. But if your mind is kind of tuned into that, you've learned a very valuable skill, okay? And so on and so forth, okay? So I clearly say, yes, you should do this at work. Go ahead and tell your boss, yeah, what are you doing? I'm doing a silly game. Are you crazy? No, I'm not crazy, I'm learning the best way possible because I'm having a bunch of fun. <clears throat> but don't, do, don't just do this at work, okay? Just do, you balance it out, okay? <sighs> now, the parting thought is this, and it came to me as I you know, evolved and parted away from the workshop, is that learning and having fun, hopefully learning while having fun, it's probably the best way 
to grow into better versions of ourselves. Uh, and, and I think in the end, that's it, what it's all about. I mean, uh, I've had a bunch of fun since January, thinking, discussion, discussing, working long nights. It was a lot of work, but a bunch of fun for, why did I do it? For love, I don't know, for passion, for friendship, for kids. But I learned a lot too, okay? I'm still figuring out all that I learned from this experience. Um, and I humbly hope that all of this, what shall I call it? This is not a talk, this is some silliness, some fun, uh, that it might motivate you and inspire you to think, maybe to put away some time, some energy or karma, if you will, uh, and dedicate it to learning and having fun with whichever silly, however silly, whatever, who are they to say, oh, this is silly, you do whatever you like. So to dedicate some time and energy to having fun and learning. And if, if you need to choose, if you can't have both, okay, go for fun, okay? If you can't have learning and fun, go for fun. So this is it. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you go out and have a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you, Tiago, for this very entertaining talk. Thank you. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. If you want, there's... Uh... Yes, I'm happy to address anything about the code, the kids, the method, and catch me out there. I'll be happy to discuss all of this at any time, okay? Go ahead. I'm right. Thank yeah, you. I, I really love the message that you have about providing kids with the ability to think, yeah, I can tweak this in the future. I, I really don't know how it works, but I know that it can be fixed. Yes. So my question is, uh, how would you address it to adults if you had to do something like this, like 20 something or 30 something? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, uh, I haven't thought about that much, but this is a thought uh, that uh, crossed my mind a lot of times. Working with kids is serious business, and you heard me say that, because kids are very wide open, so you can pretty much kind of drive them the way you want, okay? So that's a huge responsibility, okay? So they're more malleable, so to speak, okay? That's, why I meant, that's what I meant, that kids, working with kids is very serious, okay? Because you can't, like, mold them some way. I don't know how we do it adults, because as we grow up, we tend to become stiffer. Uh, but in the end, it's about showing and not telling. If you show people something that resonates with them, they will resonate with that and go from there. So from an educational standpoint, I would say that it's about finding what resonates with your target audience. And certainly what resonates with kids is a game like this. And if I want to do this with an adult, this wouldn't probably be interesting. It wouldn't resonate. I'd say that that's the key idea. But I'm happy to discuss this more. <laughs> OK. Uh, it works. Uh, Thank you very much. It was great. It was very important, I think. Uh, but I have a nitpick. You know, go ahead. This, go ahead. This pattern where you use a single underscore for a variable that you don't use. Have you ever had the um, like uh, had to use uh, get text? Get text, yes. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, get text is a, a way, is a, a, a module in the standard library that helps you internationalize or translate your code to different languages, okay? And it does a hack. It uses this underscore variable that becomes a function. So you, you uh, convert all your strings that you say to the user, say, hello, user, and then you, you wrap it up with underscore and then parentheses, and then in a, another file you say, well, hello, user is hola, utilizador, hola, usuario, blah, 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 in all the languages, and, it, and then it does that for you. So thank you, <laughs> Radomir, that's, a, that's a, a great point. As a, like a counterpoint, okay, this code that we've seen uh, is much more advanced than what we did with the kids. We didn't do any kind of lambdas. We didn't do loops. So they, they went like, draw a line, 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 draw a line. So we would, went for the basics. But thank you. That's a, a great nitpick. And I'd like to 
No, how, how to solve that? I don't know. Yeah, Go with I, I would double? like to. That's yeah. why I'm asking. I have no idea. <laughs> I never thought about it. I never thought about it. Maybe you go with a double underscore variable. I don't know. <laughs> Good idea. Thanks, Radomir. Uh, so it, it's have, gone red. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Then. So, so but can, we, can let's, talk, let's talk out there, okay? It's yeah, you can very, find... A very short question. Cool. Um, how long did it take for the kids to reach this level of... Uh, okay, game? we did... Eight hours, okay, two hours, two hours, two hours, two hours, across two days. So two hours in the morning, two hours, and we, we went slowly, okay, from... I'm happy to share you the materials. I have all the materials, all the step-by-step -step lessons, okay? Uh, but when they got here, they were comfortable in they, enough to vary some, change some conditions, play around, okay? But this was like a bit too sophisticated for what they were comfortable with. So it was kind of a balance between Having fun, being proud, look what I did, but I don't completely understand it, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>